Hi everyone, welcome to the CDS Lab um, RCM webinar series. And today's uh, talk is um, going to be by uh, Dr. Nusha Jami, um, one of our RCM members. Uh, Nuri, would you like to uh, do the introduction? Sure, thank you very much. And welcome everyone to this uh, webinar on water financing solutions. Uh, Dr. Jami is the Director of Urban Water Policy and a Research Senior Research Scholar at the Stanford Goods Institute for the Environment, a leading expert in sustainable water resource management, smart cities, and the water energy food nexus. She uses data science principles to study the human and policy dimensions of urban water and hydrologic systems. Her research through the years has been interdisciplinary and impact focused. Dr. Ajami has served as a gubernatorial appointee to the Bay Area Regional Water Quality Control Board for two terms, and is currently a major appointee to the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. She is a member of the National Academies Board on Water Science and Technology. Dr. Ajami also serves on a number of state level and national advisory boards. Before joining Stanford, she worked as a senior research scholar at the Pacific Institute and served as a science and technology fellow at the California State Natural Resource and Water Committee, where she worked on various water and energy related legislation. She has also published many highly cited peer review articles, co authored two books, and contributed with opinions uh, to the New York Times, San Jose Mercury, and the Sacramento Bee. Dr. Ajami received her PhD in civil and environmental engineering from the University of California a master's in hydrology and water resources from the University of Arizona, and a bachelor's in civil engineering from Amir Kabir University of Technology in Iran, Tehran, Iran. Welcome, Dr. Ajami. Thank you, Nuri, really appreciate it. Um, so I, maybe I just jump in and start. Um, and uh, I really appreciate uh, this opportunity. It has been a really a pleasure being part of this research coordination network. Um, I personally have learned a lot over the years from colleagues who are involved in this, um, in this effort. And, um, and today I'm just going to give you a broad context of um, how water financing in how water financing in the water sector actually, the, or the financing models in the water sectors have been evolving or need to evolve in order to address the needs that we have today. Let me actually put this on the, I'm assuming you can see my slides, right? Okay, so water connects to everything. It's, this is, um, I, I just listed a few things here. Think about public health, infrastructure, energy, environment, agriculture, forestry. I guess that's at the heart of what we are working on um, uh, with the RCN, which sort of trying to see how these interconnections work. The challenge with water is that actually a lot of the infrastructure that we built in the 20th century is facing uh, significant challenges due to uh, rising populations, competing environmental <clears throat> needs, and um, climate change uh, due to extreme weather. Uh, think about fires, uh, droughts, uh, and um, flooding. And also, uh, as I said, this infrastructure that we have, a lot of it was built in the 20th century. So it is definitely reaching the end of its lifetime and um, needs to be uh, replaced. And because of some of these challenges, we are definitely, as a sector, we are facing a, a challenge to achieve water security in the long run um, and water equity, actually, in so many cases. So, um, sorry, this is the solution. So, why do we need to rethink water financing strategies? I guess the, um, the whys and the hows um, are what I'm going to touch on here. Um, cost of addressing the aging infrastructure, which I mentioned, just that one box of aging infrastructure, it's about $1 trillion over the next 25 years in the US. Um, this number has been floating around for a number of years now, at least five, six years, and we haven't even started um, this process. So we are, we are still talking about the same number uh, over the next uh, quarter of a century. Um, and then also, and there's limited federal and state funding available. Um, there, there are some grant subsidies, tax exemptions, and 
uh, for municipal bonds, but still like there, uh, there is very limit, there are very limited options available out there to invest in infrastructure, uh, or there are so many hurdles to access that money. Also, there's an increasing pressure, um, uh, basically these two together, uh, highlight the increasing pressure to um, come up with new ways of um, investment and, inno uh, and innovation uh, in order to deal with the aging infrastructure that we are having. To give you a context here, these are 2017 dollars that this data was uh, extracted from the Bureau of Economics in 2018. Um, and uh, just to give you a sense of what's going on. So the blue line is showing the state and local government investment in uh, water resources and uh, water utilities. Um, and uh, the sort of the darker line uh, is uh, from the federal side. And what you see, and these are numbers from 50, 1956 to 2016. What do you see is that, um, over the years, we see more and more local and state money going into um, investing in water, uh, especially water utilities. And part of that demonstrated need that these utilities have to uh, achieve security and um, reliability over time. And actually we have had, um, except for this era, the earlier in the um, basically the mid century, last century, um, from then on, the, the, the federal government invest, investment in water has been quite limited and not as um, high. Another um, interesting information or data to look at is the share of infrastructure investment by the le by level of government. So what you see here is a, sort of the same thing, but in a different angle and also including other uh, sectors as well. What you see is water, um, either utilities or water resource investment um, have, is, uh, is a very small portion of federal investment compared to highways and transit and aviation. Um, and there's a longer list there that I haven't included, but just thinking about some of the other sectors that are out there. And, um, and most of the investment in these um, um, the subsectors for water are done at the local level. Um, and um, you know, considering the fact that access um, to water is definitely an economic driver for so many states and cities and communities, it is sort of uh, disappointing to see how much smaller the portion of the investment that's happening for water is. This is again the same data in a different way of looking at it. So this is again purport. This is um, the zero to one. It shows the share of infrastructure investment by different level of government. And again, blue is the state and local and um, red is uh, federal share. And what you see here, actually one thing that I want you to pay attention to is that between 1956 and um, sort of around um, mid um, seventies, late seventies, you see a, a, the portion of investment from the federal government was quite high. And part of that is actually um, is the a lot of investment that we made in large infrastructure. Think about dams and uh, uh, aqueducts and waterways that we have built over that period. Uh, just in California, a, lot, a few of our dams and um, and uh, major water infrastructure system that we have in California was built during that period. And some of that investment was made by the federal government. However. Um, Another fact to think about here is 1956, our population was half of what it is right now. And of course, these numbers are not per capita, but if we take them as an absolute number, um, you will see that per capita, even though you see that you know, there there's a reduction in investment from the federal government, if you look at that per capita, you see that it becomes quite insignificant. Uh, so since the late 70s, we have sort of federal government has been sort of stepping back and not investing as much in uh, water infrastructure and sort of playing a supporting role rather than a leading role in this process. Now, with that challenge of not having access to a lot of funding and investment, there's also a paradigm shift happening in the water sector. 
The 20th century model that we had, especially in the urban areas, uh, was built around sort of multiple principles. One was, about, it was all about growth and economic development. Uh, it was focused on centralized large infrastructure. And, um, and also the idea was these are once true systems. So we actually put water in three different buckets. We said, we have water supplies. So how, do we go, how are we going to build future water supplies? Then we are going to take the water after it's used, deal, it, deal with it as a wastewater. And then we also had stormwater and flood management. Uh, falling under the same category. And these were sort of very, very specific boundaries that were set. Um, and, uh, and this, and also this was a very much of a top-down system. Now, as we are sort of dealing with a lot of these challenges that I mentioned earlier with like climate change, population growth, aging infrastructure, and also the realization that we can't, like these boxes that we have created, actually they bleed into each other. And if we want to develop future infrastructure, we need to rethink these limitations. We will see that there is a movement to change, to create this, some, some form of a circular economy around water. So this 21st century urban water uh, use cycle looks quite different from what we built in the 20th century. Uh, there's much more interest in um, you know, conservation efficiency, trying to reuse as much as we can, uh, direct portable reuse, um, focus on green infrastructure, manage aquifer recharge. So this one linear system that we had that was water in, used in the city, water out, is turning into this very complex system. The challenge is what we build, the, the um, governance and um, systems that we, or models that we built for this, for the 20th century model, which a lot of it is still in action, doesn't necessarily fit this new model that's sort of emerging and also does not necessarily promote um, this kind of change. Um, when you're thinking about this distributed water system that is disrupting our uh, conventional urban water cycle, uh, we can think about the fact that they can create more flexibility in the system and uh, flexibility in a sense that, you know, when obviously we have all this major infrastructure that's out there, dams and aqueducts and pumps and pipes, um, however, they're, and they're aging, however, like looking forward, we are seeing it to be much less of those kind of infrastructure and much more of these smaller pieces. So create some flexibility to take the load off those um, uh, um, larger infrastructure. And also uh, it can create resiliency and some more reliability because we are sort of diversifying our supply sources. Um, however, um, as we are sort of going through this paradigm shift and diversifying our water supply and sort of revisiting our this top-down management model we had with uh, once true systems, uh, what we see is a mix of those centralized, as I said, centralized systems that we had and also these decentralized pieces that we are putting in place. So people becoming uh, producers, they are actually, for example, if you think about a building that's using, creating uh, or regenerating water, uh, they're basically producing water. So they are sort of becoming part of the generation uh, process rather than just the consumer. So this shift from centralized to decentralized is creating this hybrid model and also customers becoming a major part of this process. So. So how can we sort of finance this shift? Um, and that is the, that's sort of the major question here because obviously the conventional models we had doesn't necessarily work in this system that we are creating and requires rethinking. One of the things we did for this specific um, study that I'm gonna present is that we actually looked into the electricity sector. Partly because if you think about it, if you think about, I don't know, late 90s, um, and early to, uh, early 21st centuries, uh, early 21st century. What you what you might remember is that we didn't have that many solar panels on our roofs, or um, we actually in San Francisco have these small wind turbines, or there weren't that many like um, that much investment in these renewable energy um, uh, solutions. And um, we thought that um, you know the energy sector has been about 20, 30 years ahead of the water sector and sort of have gone through this transition, sort of going from centralized infrastructure to this hybrid model and, and has been sort of tackling a lot of challenges as part of this process. So there might be something there that we can take and use for the water sector. 
So the way we use this methodology, as I just mentioned, actually, is we looked at all the different um, non-traditional solutions that are out there. And then we were sort of interested to see at the government scale and level and at the local uh, level, how these, this transition has happened, who invested in these solutions, how these investments has happened, and what kind of funding mechanism um, were used to, these, to enable this transition, and which one of those funding mechanisms are potentially relevant to the water sector, um, either to put water sector at, under that umbrella or actually take that and replicate it for the water sector. What you see, actually, I touched on this a little bit, but what you see in the evolution of the electricity sector was like, actually, it was sort of overcoming a lot of barriers that they were facing. So um, they obviously, there was limited access to traditional public funding sources, which I mentioned earlier. So there was a challenge to actually go and find money. There was also, uh, it was very difficult to secure private investment because the risk was high and the rewards were sort of uncertain. And there was also a regulatory challenge. They also had this top-down model that wasn't built for what we are looking for right now. And um, they had to overcome that barrier. Also, there was a perception toward change. These uh, utilities and uh, governance structures that we had in place, they were designed to enable these top-down uh, centralized system. And for them to be able to shift to a more hybrid model, they had to change their perception toward change and also reevaluate re their, um, their structure. So I'm gonna walk you through a few examples of how some of the policies and regulations that were put in place enable this change in the water sector. What you see here is um, actually, so uh, this is in California, um, we passed the re um, renewable energy portfolio um, in 2002. And what you see here is the amount of capacity uh, that was built since 2002. And uh, this data goes to 2014, but that actually that number has increased significantly um, over the years because of a, the reg a regulatory push that was put in place. Basically California in 2002 uh, uh, passed a law that promote the, uh, the uh, renewable energy portfolio. There was a um, standard for 30 by 2030. Actually at this point is um, 100 by 2050. So we actually have surpassed what we were, um, what we were hoping for. Um, but basically it was established in 2002 by the legislature. And that actually brought in a lot of investment that led into increased capacity. Okay. Another thing that happened at the state level for California and eventually sort of bled into the rest of the country was this uh, renewable energy portfolio that we had and the energy um, efficiency resource standard started getting picked up by other states. And partially, remember, California is one of the largest states in, I mean, it is the largest state in um, in the US population wise, and a lot of the rules and regulations that goes in place ends up being sort of like a leading strength for change across the country. And some of these rules and regulations that we passed in California ended up actually getting picked up by other states. The, the graph on the left, uh, what it shows is the state renewable energy portfolio. The one on the right shows the state energy efficiency resources standards. That's basically the standards we are relying on today for the dishwasher, washing machine, lighting, um, light bulbs, anything that has anything to do with using less energy to achieve the same amount of, to access the same amount of outcome we were looking for. So sort of increasing productivity while reducing use. And what you see here is that many states since 2002, when California picked up the renewable energy portfolio, now actually do have renewable energy portfolio standards or goals in place. And you, this is the graph that I'm talking about. And then on the right hand side, you see that a lot of states, especially in Northeast, has picked up so many different standards for energy efficiency resources. So what does that have to do with financing? So let's talk about how um, we finance this transition. So in 
As I said, in 2002, around here, California passed the energy, uh, the renewable energy, uh, renewable porf uh, stand portfolio standards. And what you see here is amount is a billion dollars that was spent in promoting clean energy within the US, not just California, but US. But again, remember, as goes, uh, goes California, goes the whole entire country. So what you see here in 2002, we passed the law in California. And by 2006, um, the amount of money that was being invested in renewable energy solutions basically increased by 10 times. And that money wasn't coming from one source. It wasn't just public money, but actually coming from so many other resources, the corporate venture, corporations, investment bankers, private equity, crowdsourcing, venture capital. There was an opportunity to invest, to meet these regulatory, uh, new regulatory goals. And everybody was in it because there was something to be made. We all had to achieve something. And there was an opportunity, a market was created for everybody to invest in. And you see that numbers sort of like steadily uh, changing over time and increasing actually. So um, with that, what I wanna tell you is like sort of briefly wrap up about that study that I just mentioned and then provide you some other examples like concrete examples of how water sector actually is sort of embracing some of these ideas. After we studied about like 200 different projects in the water in the energy sector we basically came up with a very simple framework that was used in the water in the energy sector to enable this transition from a publicly invested uh, centralized system to the hybrid system we have right now that that incorporates lots of change and um, innovation and actually funding sources what we found was there's always need to be a catalyzer for this kind of change in the energy sector, it was the regulatory drivers that ended up actually creating market drivers that, they, that sort of went hand in hand to make, create a shift in the energy sector. Some funding, set, uh, some funding was uh, sources were established at the public level and then private funds followed. So for example, we established a public goods charge for energy in California and those dollars went to bring down the cost of capital and increase investment in the solar systems. And then that actually brought in lots of private capital as a sort of to augment that public money to enable change. Um, that, so those public funds and private funds sort of went hand in hand to, um, to move the sector forward. Um, another piece that basically was very, very important as part of this transition was using resource pathways. So there's one thing to have funding available or different people bringing money to the table. There's another thing that engages that money and distributes, distributes it among different users and, con and um, stakeholders. So uh, for example, in California, we established um, you know, direct subsidies that ended up going into um, uh, bringing the cost of, again, cost of capital down. And that ended up, uh, and this is actually not just California, across the country, you see that, you know, there are so many different subsidies for putting solar panels on your roof or replacing your um, windows or, um, you know, uh, just name it. Um, and uh, basically those direct subsidies ended up going into, um, uh, in, into the hand of the consumers. And then basically for every dollar that they ended up spending almost two or three dollars that maybe a customer would be willing to, uh, to spend to replace or, uh, or uh, in, uh, implement some of those solutions. And eventually actually a lot of that money also went into, as I said, eliminating capital upfront capital cost, which, which often is the largest um, portion of and the hardest thing to invest in. Now, these are all might look very um, obvious to you just because obviously we always need to have some form of a funding available and we have to sort of distribute it somehow. However, one thing that really, really, really helped the energy sector to absolutely make this shift was, was some of the governance structures that we put that was put in place. Think about it this way. So um, for, for every individual to have a solar panel on their roof, it's not worth it to go in a, for, for an investor to go, go put money in these individual solutions. But if you take a neighborhood and say, 
for this specific neighborhood with uh, 200 houses in it or uh, 1,000 homes in it, we want to put solar panels on every roof. Then all of a sudden you aggregated all these projects and the risk comes down, the reward goes up, and then you are not dealing with individuals. So this aggregation of funds and projects became actually a very uh, major, sorry, playing major role in the energy sector. Another piece was performance contracting. Um, there was an interest to know, okay, so if we are investing in these solutions, what does it mean? How does it change access? So there was a lot of work done on changing the way we measure success as we transition from centralized to decentralized. Also, there was also a lot of effort around net metering. So, so sort of basically trying to figure out, okay, so how, um, you know, if I'm generating electricity and I'm not just a consumer of electricity, but um, sort of producer of electricity, can I put it back in the grid? This process ended up encouraging some people to start um, uh, investing in, um, in uh, alternative solutions. And also there was a revenue decoupling. Um, the energy sector was similar to the water sector it is right now. As you used energy, you had to pay for it. But the reality is there's a fixed cost associated with the infrastructure we have. So energy sector went through this process of changing. So basically making sure that they can always recover the cost of service that they're providing, especially when it comes to the fixed cost that they have. And then on top of that, they would charge people for amount of water energy that they were using. And this separating the amount of fixed costs from variable costs they had, it helped the energy utilities to promote conservation and efficiency and actually um, uh, customers generating electricity because it wasn't hurting the bottom line so much. And also it wasn't hurting the revenue uh, that they needed to maintain their infrastructure. So I would say one of the major changes that happened in the energy sector was actually creating these innovative governance structures. So I'm gonna quickly walk through a few case studies that um, um, in the water sector that have used this uh, model. Um, the storyline goes that uh, we, we did this study, we were done, we published it. And then we started getting calls from people super excited about the study telling us, look, we actually did this. We, re did, go we did try to use net metering for water and it's working. Or we did try to do aggregation and this is the outcome. So we decided to kind of start tabulating these um, success stories to kind of create this peer-to-peer -peer learning and also promote some of these solutions. So I'm gonna bring up a few of those solutions here. So um, just the mechanisms that are highlighted, we actually created the living map um, uh, for, the, uh, for, invest, for um, financing water infrastructure. And um, uh, we started putting everybody on the map and highlighting what kind of mechanism they used as part of the bigger framework we had created. And we sort of identified a number of things that has happened from, as I said, aggregation, performance-based rebates, and all those different solutions. One of the things that was very, uh, very much attractive to the energy, uh, to the um, water sector, and still is in a, a process of becoming more, creating more footing in the sector. Um, hopefully, uh, we'll see more of it soon. Is the impact-driven bonds? Um, basically, it's promoting positive social and environmental change can bring in people to the table that are interested in sustainability and are motivated, um, uh, the investors that are motivated to invest in these solutions for maybe smaller rate of return, but for actually uh, for them to be able to account that as a sustainability action. Um, one of these examples are um, the DC um, environmental impact fund, uh, bond that exists right now. Um, basically, they had to deal with their, uh, they had to reduce the runoff um, in the, uh, by the, basically in 20 acres. They, they wanted to um, install green infrastructure. They had to deal with some of their um, uh, runoff to Chesapeake Bay. So this was something that they decided to do instead of building more large stormwater capture systems and retentions, they decided actually to invest in green infrastructure. And uh, basically to make this happen, they identified different places that they can potentially invest in green infrastructure, a distributed system of solutions across the city. And to make that happen, they, uh, they worked with Goldman Sachs and um, 
COVID, found, the COVID Foundation to actually secure about $25 million to invest in this system. One thing that was very innovative about what they did was they created this performance tiers because the money was there. They wanted to bring in people to, to install these green infrastructures, but they didn't want, the DC Water didn't want to be the only risk, risk taker in this process because if they would have invested and it wouldn't work, what would have happened? So they actually created these performance tiers and people came in and created different, uh, you know, the, the, the proposals that were put on place um, were focused on, okay, how can you, what's the risk and reward in this process? So basically DC Water, if they uh, performance, um, the fir first tier of performance, but if the runoff was reduced by, um, more than 41%, which was quite significant, DC Water would actually pay the investors about $3 million because they would have saved, why? Because they would have saved from the fines that they had to pay for, um, for not being able to meet their stormwater uh, capture requirements. And, and they already had the seized and deceased order for that. Um, the second tier was, you know, if it's between 18% and 41%, um, uh, basically nobody owes anybody anything. Um, and then if actually the reduction was less than 18%, the investors would pay DC water. This actually ended up being a very important process because then the selection process went on and the, uh, and the design process was very diligently done to make sure they can capture these requirements. Uh, the second uh, example I have is the Forest Resilience Bond, which is, um, um, which is done by um, 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 an amazing small um, organization um, uh, called Blue Forest Conservation. And um, basically their goal is to aggregate funds and aggregate beneficiaries. So the way that, that they, they have established themselves is um, if you do forest management, so many different people would benefit from it. Think about US Forest Service. If somebody cleans up the forest, they have, there's a reduced wildfire severity there, therefore, and then the wildlife will be protected. Water utilities can benefit from it because water quality is protected and also watershed would be protected. Electric utilities, obviously a lot of you might have heard that um, PG&E right now uh, is dealing with a lot of uh, um, aftermaths of these fires they have had in California. Basically power generation can increase and also, also there would be a, a reduction in the cost of dealing with aftermaths of wildfires or uh, reservoir uh, sedimentation, which can also impact their production. And then state and public, uh, state government can benefit from this as well because uh, you know, reduced cost of um, 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 cost of uh, firefighting, the public safety and health, good job creation. There's a long list of things you can, and these are just a handful of things that exist. Basically, the idea is the investors put money in, the implementation partners do the job, the beneficiaries actually pay accordingly. Right, and if they can achieve this outcome, eventually investors can be paid. So there is a redu reduction of risk and uh, increase of uh, be uh, benefits. And also realize if each one of these boxes by themselves want to do this, they have to put a lot more money in to make it happen. But if co they collectively invest in the system, they each can put a little bit, but at the end they have a aggregated funds that can help the investors to recover their investment. So these are just the two examples I brought up here. And I would say um, just uh, the challenge that you see this is these are not being picked up as fast and easily across the country is that while it's really easy to say um, there are so many beneficiaries or we can build this thing easily everywhere, um, it is hard to kind of measure the performance of the systems. And also remember, we are still stuck in this 20th century model that we have. Therefore, the performance measures that are in place are very much sort of um, uh, favorable to some of those solutions. I can put green infrastructure everywhere in my city, but that green infrastructure might not at the end be as great, uh, give me as great of a result as a, um, as a you know a stormwater drain that I can or a 
uh, brain that I can build in a one-to-one -one solution, but it can bring a lot more value. For example, it can create outdoor space for people benefit from, and a lot of different things can help the energy um, uh, use. It can create wildlife and habitat, create community space. So the investment, while it doesn't bring one outcome, it can bring an array of uh, uh, benefits. But the problem is we are not used to measuring these things individually and adding them up and aggregating them. We are used to, you remember at the beginning, I said we are in our own personal silos. We are measuring everything within our own silo and trying to um, justify the investment within that silo. So it's very, very difficult to get people to kind of um, value this kind of a broader set of benefits and actually be able to justify, justify investment. However, if we can create this partnership across groups, we can reduce risk, increase access to capital, increase res resiliency. So there's the, the other side of this. So if we can create a, a metrics that can actually measure all these benefits and sort of aggregate them and bring these beneficiaries to the table, we can ultimately do all these things together for less money and better outcomes. We did actually a quick study uh, uh, a couple of years ago. We looked at various uh, cities across the, con uh, across the world that are incorporating green infrastructure as part of their portfolio to deal with stormwater management. And, um, and we tried to see if they are actually accounting for some of these benefits as part of their, invest as part of their funding and financing mechanism. What we found was, um, there is actually an interest. The performance metrics are sort of evolving within those models that we saw. Um, there is an interest in this increase uh, in quality of life. Definitely, there, you can see that both in domestic and international models that we looked at, everybody is acknowledging that as part of their uh, social elements. However, when it comes to some of the other benefits, um, you know, the reduction of urban heat and increase environmental awareness and engagement, there is an acknowledgement, but it's not fully incorporated in the metrics in the way the investment has happened. So there is an effort to measure these things. However, when it comes to who paid money to invest in these solutions, we can always see ultimately one of those silos, if it's a water sector, if it's a wastewater sector, Basically, one of those silos has made the investment. However, they have tried to highlight the sort of auxiliary benefits to the broader community as it comes to that. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm mindful of the time. I, I can go to another example here uh, with public-private partnerships. Um, maybe I'll quickly walk through this actually. Um, so. Another model that's sort of emerging over time beyond those uh, impact bonds and uh, environmental impact bonds that we talked about and challenge of uh, changing performance measures is this new models of public-private partnerships. Conventionally, public-private partnerships, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard of, is um, it was, they were very transactional. Somebody would come in, bid on a project, they would build it. Um, you know, it was uh, the performance is, was based on contractual agreements, will deliver X. And it was always about, um, you know, everybody at the table was trying to minimize the risk and increase the profit. And often this happened from the private sector side because they were much more equipped to minimize the risk and increase the profit. And and actually in the water sector, we see example after example that this had led to um, increased risk for the, uh, for the utility or the community that worked with these private entities. And actually they, they were left with some of the consequences of the decisions that were made. Um, however, there's this new model that's emerging, which is called community-based public-private partnership. And it's very much different. It's, it's all about relational contracts. So basically there's, there needs to be a long-term trust and confidence between the partners. It needs to be aligned goals for public and private sector. It cannot be, I am a private entity. I'm coming to minimize my risk and increase my profit and get this done and leave. But actually 
what is this public, what is this community is looking for? Is it jobs? Is it um, more outdoor space? Is it this? Like, you know, a multitude of solutions that are looking for. And then the private entity was also obviously has a priority list that they're interested. So they try to share risk and responsibility of the private project management. And one thing that's very, very important in these new models um, of public-private partnership is transparency. So who gains what from what, and also a, a local economic growth. Often they're actually required to hire from the, uh, from the community that they're working in and actually try to uh, increase the quality of life in urban underserved communities. Therefore, that becomes one of the priorities that whoever is bidding on the project to meet or demonstrate if they want that project to happen. And, um, and this is actually um, and a, a great example of it is um, that recently has happened in Prince George County in Maryland. They actually had to deal again, uh, to deal with stormwater issues. The same, the same um, bay, Chesapeake Bay, um, uh, water quality issues uh, drove this, um, this action as well in Maryland. And um, they wanted to build a design, build, operate, maintain um, a contract to someone. And they had to treat about 4,000 acres of impervious areas to make this happen. So basically what they did was um, they set certain goals. They had to meet the EPA requirements for their total uh, maximum daily loads for, as I said, for the Chesapeake Bay by 2025. So what they did was they actually uh, created, they did multiple solutions at the same time. One, they actually created a fee uh, to promote uh, implementation of the, some, of the, uh, uh, some of the green infrastructure solutions and to, in order to bring in people uh, to actually invest in these solutions. Um, they, uh, they, uh, they try to also invest in O&M cost of these systems. Obviously, just because you build an infrastructure, it doesn't mean that you, you're done. You have to maintain these systems. Even when they are green uh, infrastructure, you have to maintain them. And they created, as I said, incentive-based uh, fees uh, to deliver project and also promote socioeconomic change by incorporating county-based businesses, minority port and protected classes, um, and to create jobs in this process as well. Okay, so I'm gonna actually skip this because I don't think we have time, um, but at some point I would like, I'm happy to talk about some of the other ways of communities can collaborate together to achieve um, uh, long-term uh, res resiliency as well. And just wrap up this talk by focusing on some of the things that are very, very important as we are sort of shifting to a different financing model for this hybrid infrastructure model we're building. And um, one thing is going back to that performance measures that we talked about. We have to change or expand the definition of infrastructure. Um, some of you that uh, are involved in our um, uh, RCN know that this is actually very near to, dear to my heart, probably because when you're talking about infrastructure, often people think about gray, gray infrastructure, pipes, pumps, roads, um, you know, uh, transmission lines, everything that's massive and large and actually has some form of a man-made infrastructure in it. We don't walk around and look at our parks and say, oh, this is an infrastructure, because that's not how we think about them. But the reality is actually a lot of the green spaces or nature uh, the based uh, na natural systems that we have are part of our infrastructure model. Think about wetlands, marshlands, um, uh, you know, parks and, uh, you know, uh, all the outdoor spaces that we have, they can actually help us to deal with climate change, deal with sea level rise, deal with flooding, increase water security. So they can bring a lot of different benefits to the table. Another piece is actually um, you know, data and information and digital solutions. These are all part of the infrastructure, but we are not accounting for them as an infrastructure. Therefore, we are not investing in them as an infrastructure. So we have to actually expand the boundaries of infrastructure. What does it mean? How does it work? And actually uh, uh, enlarge that um, uh, sort of boundaries in a way that you incorporate more things. 
another uh, another piece of this is we have to actually enact policies and economic forces that would drive change. I, you know, the example I wanted to mention, which I didn't have time to talk about, is was sort of trying to create a similar goal for the water sector that we had with the energy sector with renewable energy portfolio. If we had something like that with water, imagine if we would have said if if a, one of the states would have said by. 2030, we would like to have 30% of the water for every region come from alternative water supplies. That would have been a goal that everybody would have aimed to accomplish. And those kind of goals, as I showed you, can drive change, bring people to the table, promote investments, and bring more um, um, oppor find funding opportunities to the table. So these portfolio standards, demand side management and pricing can definitely cr create this economic force that drives change. Um, we talked about um, establishing innovative funding solutions and governance structure. As I mentioned, um, uh, what we saw in our study was that the energy sector definitely benefited from some of these governance structures that were put in place, from net metering to unbuilt financing, from trading mechanisms, uh, from green banks. You know, all these different uh, governance structures definitely enabled, or aggregation mechanisms enabled change in the energy sector. And uh, and they basically uh, led to mobilizing some of the non-governmental and private capital. So we have to kind of come up with the better ways of doing that. And then uh, another piece is utilizing a diverse financing strategies. We can't just rely on one type of financing. We can't always say municipal bonds are going to solve our life. Um, solve our water challenges and we are going to use them forever and ever to build the next infrastructure or we are going to wait for government bonds or government uh, or uh, uh, federal investment for infrastructure we need to have a broad diverse set of uh, financial models in place if we want to be able to have a reliable uh, model that we can depend on uh, during economic downturns and economic upturns, like, you know, all these different times we are dealing with. So it's important to have a diverse financial strategy in place to minimize risk and increase economic potential. Cost sharing, as I said, very, very important. Cost sharing can be work with customers to invest in these solutions. Think about small solar panels on people's roofs or on-site reuse uh, for every building to you know, regional solar farms or wind uh, farms and, uh, you know, and again, regional recycling solutions. Another piece is, uh, so, which basically I think that actually plays a very, very important role when it comes to, um, when it comes to investment. I give you, so, and then, um, so it can also happen more. So, uh, for example, I'll give you an example with the, you know, I have the word developer here, but so, for example, San Francisco is a great example of this. They actually passed a law that said uh, every building that's larger than 250,000 square foot, um, they have to uh, in the, incorporate on-site reuse in, the, in their building. And basically, uh, the investment was supposed to happen by the developers because they were the one who wanted to build these large um, uh, high-rises, so that would help them um, that basically that helped San Francisco to shift the cost that they wanted to, um, that they had to make to meet future demand by investing in these solutions through sort of providing these incentives for the developers to make that investment and actually take the pressure off them. And with that, I am just going to stop and uh, hopefully we have about 10 minutes to answer any questions anybody may have. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, we actually, thank you for the great presentation. We actually have one question from Professor Michael Bakker. Okay. Hi, Nusha. Hi, Michael, uh, how are you? Good, thank you for a really interesting talk. Um, and uh, I hope, I hope they'll, I have to get off at one, but I hope can, discussion might continue amongst uh, the participants. Sure. Uh, we've had some good success with that. Um, I, I noticed that, um, you know, you, yes. you had one slide where you showed all the, all the different kinds of benefits. You emphasized how we have to add up all the different benefits, um, you know, to make the case. Mm -hmm. And this reminds me um, of st stacked benefits that uh, has been promoted uh, by NYSERDA, uh, New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. 
especially for, for battery storage, mm -hmm. um, where the, where the um, market case is very hard to make. There's not much market case. So you're basically trying to find everything you can and, and stack it up. And, and so it, it seems to me that the approach looks like a, um, a little bit of a, you know, what do we do to create private sector funding? Because a lot of your argument seems to drive that with the heavy reliance on, on state and local funding for water, uh, that they can't really sustain perhaps the, the level of, uh, of investment that's required for the paradigm shift. And so there has to be more funding from somewhere. And so can we get it from the private sector? And the private sector, of course, requires a profit motive. Um, but if we don't have a profit motive, you know, how do we uh, value all these things that lie outside the market, all these externalities? And, and, um, and you know, that's a, that's a tough case, it seems to me, for water. So my question really is about how the starting points might make a difference. I mean, I'm, you know, we've discussed this before that, that water and electricity, it's, it's really interesting to me as an energy engineer that you're using electricity as your model markets because they're, they're so full of, of trouble. But, um, you know, the electric and industry the has always been a private industry. Um, it's always had a market role, a profit motive. It's always had investors and and you know, sale of stocks, uh, you know, investment raised through the stock markets. Um, you know, yes, it's regulated, but it's private. Um, not everywhere, but mostly in the U in the U.S. Mostly, not so you know different in Europe. So maybe a different case. But you know, water. There's no, you know, it has never been had that. It's coming from a public sector place. It's not coming from a private sector place. So how much of that starting point issue is making it difficult to make this shift? You know, even the case you give of, of the Prince George case, you know, it's still, it's a public, it's, it's privatization of a public, of a publicly funded share, process. Bobby, can you, you know? share of the So I, I just wonder about the fit. And, and yeah, the I'm, I'm I'm happy to talk to you about this. Actually, this is um, uh, this was definitely a reaction we got when we did the study, and um, and I would say um, if a few things. Maybe I should have highlighted these. One is the idea is not privatization versus public. It's actually um, a lot of these investments that are happening in the energy sector is not private. Further privatizing the energy sector, it is actually bringing money in to augment what already exists. So, and the idea is to do the same thing. And you see that in, a, in San Francisco as an example, which, you know, all these developers are putting these on-site reuse in these buildings, right? Um, which actually eventually taking the cost off the rest of the public, because if they don't do that, then somebody else has to build another recycling plan to meet the future needs of the city as population is growing. So I don't necessarily think it's all about ownership and who owns what. However, and I, yes, I absolutely agree. Water energy sector, 80% private um, investor owned, 20% publicly owned versus water is to totally flipped. But that doesn't mean that we cannot get enough people to bring money in and make a case for the water sector because the way it's going right now, we are all going to fail. Unless you are a major utility who, know, who knows exactly how to do what and has the best credit rating and can access as much capital as they can. Otherwise, there's no way you can justify uh, any investment. And you can see out of 52,000 water utilities we have out there, many of them cannot make a deal, make it, uh, make a, justify the, those kind of investments just because they actually don't have the right rate setting process. They're not collecting enough revenue. They don't have the uh, setup to invest in these solutions. Another, another piece I'll bring up, Michael, is I think I, I hear you with, um, you know, who is investing in what. And I would say when I talk about cost sharing, I want you to think about not just 
uh, you know, a venture capitalist coming, putting money into this. I'm talking about uh, maybe me as an individual replacing my front um, uh, front driveway, right? So it's a it's a, a and and maybe my replacing my driveway is not necessarily making a huge dent in the system, but it's one out of many, and so it can aggregate a lot of these things to become one become an important outcome. So it's it's a combination of different bringing different people to the table. But, and then that eventually can reduce risk as you're investing. One last point I want to make here is, um, is you know, Google's and Facebook's, and I'm, I'm sure in, you know, uh, New York, very similar, all these major um, uh, companies are already making a lot of investment to deal with climate change. Many of those actually can have a water angle into them. Why aren't they? Right, so they can actually put those dollars towards improving our water security in so many different ways, but they're not. And, and they are not necessarily looking for recovering their investment. They are actually looking for being a good player in the system. So there are so many different players out there. And as you saw when I was showing the investment portfolio, you see that maybe venture capitalists and private capital is a portion of it not the major part of it. There are corporations, there are like, um, there are investors. I mean, there's so many different people who come to the table and the idea is to have all of them at the table rather than right now that we have none of them at the table. Thank you, Dr. Nusha. And we have a few more questions. I don't know if we have enough sure. time, but I would like to- I'm happy to stay on. Try one or two. Sure. Um, Professor Hilary Brown. Great, thank you so much. What a, what a fabulous presentation. Um, you. you did um, emphasize the non-traditional, uh, the need for non-traditional invest, uh, infrastructure investments, but we still have legacy infrastructure, which we cannot dismiss. We're still dependent Absolutely. on it. And so my question is this, and we still have something called the state revolving funds mm -hmm. um, that the feds could replenish, um, and, and that would go towards, you know, not maintenance, but new, new equipment as needed. Um, we, we really need to have the feds do that, particularly since the states at this moment in time are, are bankrupt, right? Because of COVID. Uh, yep. So uh, um, my question is, you know, to your knowledge, is there movement to, um, uh, around this this question, and then I have one other very short question. Yeah, so let, let me address this one. So I, I think state revolving fund is a great example, especially because it sort of has this whole uh, uh, replenish, refill, um, uh, allocate, and then re replenish again. So which is which is a great model, and actually energy sector really dependent on that. Um, actually as a model as well when, when it was transitioning. So, so yes, absolutely that can be used. One thing I would say, Hillary, I think um, maybe you didn't come across, but when I was talking about this performance measure, one of the challenges we have is actually sometimes it's difficult to get federal dollars or state dollars to invest in these alternative solutions, such as green infrastructure, because they are not penciling out, right? If I am building a large wastewater treatment plant, I can say I can deal with the wastewater of this whole town yeah. or stormwater of this whole town. But if, you know, we are not as, an, as a nation and actually we are generally not very good as deal, uh, at dealing with uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, these nature-based solutions are uncertain solutions. They are not giving you these deterministic engineering answers that you're all looking for. Yeah. And I think as part of that performance, I didn't touch on this that much, but when I was talking about changing the infrastructure boundary, I was actually really meant it in a sense of we really at, at the federal and state level, we have to change our definition of our infrastructure then People, we, state will put more money into it. You know, Army Corps would put more money into it. So as other private entities. And I, I think one other, uh, one other thing I would mention is, 
the legacy infrastructure issue is very important. And that's why I keep talking about this hybrid infrastructure because we are not going to get rid of those. Those are staying. Yeah. And my biggest fear when it comes to that part is I don't want anybody to be left behind with these legacy infrastructure and the, the staggering cost of maintaining them. If we actually constantly taking people off them yeah. and putting them on individual solutions, then gradually you're gonna have that happen. So that needs actually to be on our eyesight as we are making that decision. Um, we can sure. continue. Um, can I just yeah, if we has kind of a question? Sure, oh, okay. go ahead. In response to that. Oh, okay. Yes, you're absolutely right. The the feds have to change and the states have to to undergo a, a paradigm shift in what constitutes infrastructure. Uh, we also have the problem with the regulatory sector. Yes. Uh, which is totally, um, uh, we're, we're hogtied by the lack of ability of the regulatory sector to come aboard uh, these soft path green infrastructure systems. Yes, absolutely. And, and I would say, again, I, I did try to touch, I mean, there's so many different angles into it. I'm happy to send you some of the work we have done, but um, the regulatory process alongside of definition of infrastructure is the same problem because, again, we, I, I have this thing that actually I borrowed it from someone else, someone else which is we have the 19th century laws, 20th century infrastructure, and 21st century problems. And you know, unless we really revisit all these different pieces, we can't really uh, move forward. And while I'm a huge fan of Clean Water Act, which has absolutely uh, revitalized our uh, water um, uh, ways and cleaned our, you know, um, our systems in so many different ways, still was 50 years ago when we put that in place, right? So. We are still dealing with that. And actually, um, as a regulator, when I was on the regional board, we actually dealt with that a lot because people who want to build these other alternative solutions, they have to sort of navigate this regulatory process in a very, very fine way to be able to implement a horizontal levy, for example, or a, a, you know, or a wetland or a marshland. And, um, and we, you, know, you have to think about as a regulator, how can you become more flexible or deal with these sol solutions in an innovative way while you are addressing the regulatory requirement that you have in place? So you're absolutely correct. The regulatory process is as um, rigid and as inflexible as a lot of other things that we have in place. Um, so yes, that absolutely needs to be revisited. And I think the energy sector sort of did that because they had a crisis mm -hmm. and that crisis led to change. Um, with water, we are actually sort of, it's, you know, it's sort of local in a way, like, you know, when California is in a drought, New York is not in a drought. When New York is in a, you know, dealing with, uh, uh, you know, Sandy, we are not dealing with Sandy. So it's very difficult. While our solution portfolios are very similar, we are not dealing with some of these crises at the same time. So it makes it challenging, but absolutely. Thank you both. And we have the last question for Jeffrey, Professor Jeffrey. Hi, Nusha. Uh, Hi, Jeff. How are you? Good, good. Thanks for really such an interesting um, presentation. Um, I'm really interested in this uh, slide that you had on financing green infrastructure through um, this notion of co-benefits. Uh -huh. and, um, and obviously, you know, there are different mechanisms uh, such as floating bonds or public-private partnership with the return on investment. Um, and what you're suggesting here is there's really not this kind of uh, paradigm shift to include the kind of co-benefits that you know people like Bree Brown have been working on for a very long time. Um, so are there, I mean, do you, so I saw the, the sort of bar charts, but seeing actual examples where this is baked into the, let's say uh, public private partnership uh, uh, request, you know, the RFPs, for example, that go out so that um, maybe the state, the, the, the public sector partners up with the private sector so that there's a sort of uh, uh, 
an economic incentive for the private sector to take on the risk. The public sector will essentially uh, carry some of the risk uh, in relationship to the sort of uh, uh, you know baked in benefits. So I guess so. I mean, for example, uh, reducing urban heat island equals you know lower cost for reduced energy loads and public health outcomes. You know that's something that the public sector, the private sector, is not necessarily going to take on as a risk. But that's something that the public sector would be very uh, interested in is central to. Right. So, yeah. so I was just wondering, you know, on that. And I think one of the mechanisms there, if I could suggest, is, is uh, around sort of scenario modeling, where mm -hmm. that's a role that the universities and research centers could take, where really the sort of uh, developing these, you know, sophisticated scenario models could, could help to kind of. Uh, provide a, a level of, I don't want to say certainty because nothing is certain, but at least, a, you know, to approximate the kinds of benefits. Yeah, I mean, I think you touched on it. Uh, it, it is it's definitely a challenge. I love the idea of scenario modeling. I think we need to accumulate enough work to demonstrate some of these um, outcomes and help. One, one thing to be honest with you that I constantly struggle with and I'm worried about is as we in an academic world sort of slowly moving toward building these uh, better performance measures to inform the policymaking process, the policymaking process is going in parallel with the speed of light to kind of do what they are doing, they have been doing for a long time or they're sort of evolving as they want to. And, um, and I think, you know, the more we can sort of engage uh, these the, the studies that we do, we can engage more of the um, public sector as part of the process as we have been trying to do with the RCN, uh, the better, so this exchange of ideas, this sort of cross pollination that can happen. And, uh, we can build solutions that pe somebody can use. Uh, you know, my my biggest, to be honest with you, frustration right now, and I mentioned that actually both to Hillary and, and Michael, is this whole notion of climate mitigation. It is, while it's very important and essential, it's constantly leaving water behind. Um, so it's not necessarily uh, dealing with adaptation. We are not making enough, we are not taking advantage of our dollars to do climate adaptation as much as we are focusing on mitigation. And that, that disconnect is going to come back and haunt us at some point because the reality is we have to equally think about water as we are thinking about mitigation as what, when we are thinking about it during adaptation process. So, um, Yes, I agree with you. I think there's a lot of opportunity there and it's very difficult to kind of ju justify some of these investments when you're looking across the board. Partly, again, one, one, one other thing I would say is just partly also because these are siloed systems. Um, the energy sector is not as much interested in, um, in public health issues because it's not in their wheelhouse to deal with public health issues. That's not their priority or their goal. Um, so trying to kind of making sure these, uh, these sectors bleed into each other is also very important. And I can see Jeffrey is uh, frozen. I don't know if he can hear me. Hear yeah, me yeah right. I can hear you. Okay, yeah. perfect. <laughs> because <laughs> your, your picture is frozen, so I wasn't 100% sure. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, guess, I guess there's a lot of opportunity out there. And I think it's um, the more we can do to push these boundaries, the better it is. And, um, and I am, I'm, I'm, I'll tell you, I'm every day I'm encouraged by a lot of the work that's being done right now and the focus that's sort of being put on these whole cross-sectoral performance measures and issues around how each decision we make in one sector can have a broad consequences in the other sectors. And I think, again, going back to RCN, we constantly talk about this whenever, uh, whenever we are together um, to sort of, sorry, sort of see how, um, how potentially you can think about water in the light of energy and food and the other way around and, you know. Sure, sure. It's important, absolutely. But I'm, I'm with you and I love that scenario modeling. I think that's an excellent um, way of approaching this. Just because it's so complex, you can't, you can't have one model and do everything with it. Yep. I'm sure uh, many of the RC members agree with you on that. <laughs> 
Um, well, thank you, Nusha, so much for the wonderful talk. Uh, I think we we established a LinkedIn group and also a YouTube channel. So I, I know there are many questions that we couldn't cover with just so short one hour. And please cover on in the conversation on our LinkedIn and we'll have um, a continued conversation afterwards. Um, well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks, Nisha. Thank you. Thank you, Nisha.